Would you join me in this Thanksgiving a call to worship? The world is filled with the glory of God, and we say, Thank you. The hills and the valleys are filled with color, and we say, Thank you. The vines and the trees are filled with fruit, and we say, Thank you. Our tables are overflowing with food, and we say, our life is filled with the love of family and friends, and we say, Thank you. We fill this house of God with our voices saying, Thank you. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O God. Father, it is with joyous thanksgiving that we gather as community tonight reflecting upon the good gifts that you have poured into our lives over this past year, in anticipation of the gathering tomorrow of family and friends around the table to take the rich bounty which you have provided and find satisfaction for our souls. Receive our praise as we enter in. We come through Christ. Amen. Join me as we sing together for the beauty of the earth. from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Greet one another tonight in Christian fellowship.
Psalm 103 encourages us to count the blessings of the Lord. First and foremost is the gift of forgiveness. Let us once again seek the Lord's favor as we pray this prayer of confession together. Gracious and good creator, you have given us so much, but too often we take those gifts for granted or as something to which we are entitled. You call us to live in caring community, but too often we place our wants and needs first, with those of others a distant second. You call us to share your good gifts with the world around us, but we are worried that there may not be enough, and our worry gets in the way of our sharing. For all the times when we mistreat and misuse your gifts, for all the times we assume that we get what we have by ourselves, forgive us and lead us back to the path of wisdom. God is a gracious giver. God is gracious in forgiveness. 
God calls us to new patterns and new life. We are a forgiven people, and we pray to our God in community, holy in one. Amen. Indeed, God is a gracious giver and gracious in his forgiveness. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's respond. Thank you, Lord. to come before God. We will begin with a few moments of silence for each of us to look back on the year that was and in spite of the ups and downs to see the blessing that God has given to us personally, to our family, to the circle of our relationships, how he has provided us with what we need when we needed it. Let us pray silently, and then I will close. But let us come now into the presence of God with thanksgiving. Father, the scriptures read your praises. But it is also good for us to sit in a few moments of silent reflection, looking at your good gifts, looking at your perfect timing, how we have not too little or too much, but at just the right time, your grace was received. Yes, there were times when you made us wait longer than we would have liked. There were moments when you took away things that we thought were so very, very important. There were moments of great joy, but there were also moments of great sorrow. Yet all of these things are according to your will. Father, we ask for faith to accept all things from your hand with thanksgiving. To reflect upon what we have and to show true gratitude not merely to hope and dream for what might be, but to say thank you, Lord, for this moment, this day, for the gifts that you have given to each of us uniquely, as if you were giving to an only child. We praise you for all that you are good, gracious, merciful, 
loving. A generous father who lavishes upon his children the best that heaven can offer. We thank you for what you have done. The greatest gift of all, the gift of your son. In less than a few days' time, we will once again begin the celebration of the gift. And we want to begin the thanksgiving now. For you sent your Son into the world. And we have received grace. That is coming and is already here. Showing your love to sinners and reminding the saints that they need to repent. Yet for all your effort, we gave you a cross. Yet even that was part of the direction. For the empty tomb. For it is that hope. It is that good news. That transforms even the worst experiences of this past year. Into reasons to say thank you. We may have experienced loss in so many ways. We may have lost jobs. We may have lost money. We may have lost those things that the world holds dear. Yet still we are rich in your grace. We may have lost loved ones through the, the door of death. But for them, there is thanksgiving today because they are with you. And for us, there is hopeful gratitude because someday we will be with them again. You have promised to replace all that has been lost the day of your return. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for that which is to come. For soon and very soon you will come to gather the harvest in. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that in that in-between time, you are pouring out the good gifts upon us. You are showing us that God is for us. You are reminding us that all things are working together for our good. God, we just want to thank you tonight. We have sung your praises. We have lifted our words. We have silently bowed within our hearts in humble gratitude. And we just want to keep on saying thank you. Thank you, thank you. 10,000 reasons would not be enough. Indeed, eternity will barely scratch the surface of our thanksgiving. Yet, Father, hear our prayers tonight. The prayers that we offer up when we recognize your many blessings. And we thank you for each and every one. And tomorrow when we gather around the table with family or friends or even just ourselves alone with you, the thanksgiving will continue for all that you have given. Father, hear our prayers tonight. Listen to the song of our heart as they are lifted up in praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we prepare to turn to God's word this evening from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I would ask that we would stand together and we would prepare our hearts with the words, in all things, give him thanks.
God's word this evening from the pen of Paul to the Ephesians. Just two verses from chapter 5 of that letter. Paul continues speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a quote that goes sharper than a serpent's tooth is to have a thankless child. Sharper than a serpent's tooth is to have a thankless child. Interestingly enough, many people, when they hear that quote, assume it is from the scriptures. And it comes from one of the Proverbs or one of the sayings of Jesus. In fact, this quote is from Shakespeare. It was spoken by King Lear. But it could be a biblical quote. For this saying, sharper than a serpent's tooth is to have a thankless child, is something that the Bible understands. It is something that we find replete in Scripture. That God's children are often thankless children. As the children of Israel drew to the close their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because of their stubbornness to follow God, Moses stands them there between the two mountains with the Jordan before them, and he begins to instruct them. And one of the main instructions is learn to be thankful. Learn gratitude before and when you enter the promised land. Why does he say this? Because God, speaking through Moses, tells the people what's going to happen. God says, I know that you are going to go into the land overflowing with milk and honey. You are going to take possession of houses you did not build. You are going to acquire fields that you did not prepare or plant. You are going to get all of the good things that this land has to offer. And when you receive the blessing, you will forget me. You will begin to say to yourself, look what my hands have done. Look at what I have built. Look what I have planted and, and grew and, and harvested. Look at me. And God says, you will forget all about me. The people said, no, 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 Lord, that's never going to happen. But it wasn't too many years after Joshua led them into the promised land in the time of Judges that the people abandoned God and they forgot to thank Him for the goodness that He had given them. And that really is kind of the, the story of fallen humanity. Ingratitude, thanklessness, really is part of the human condition since the fall. Adam and Eve had it all, yet they, they gave it away because they forgot to be thankful to God. And that understanding of humanity goes from the Old Testament into the New. And time and time again, Paul um, admonishes, Paul calls upon the people of God to be thankful. To be grateful to God for what he has done. And what he has promised to do. Yet Paul, like Moses before him, 
warns young Timothy that in the last days, the days in which we find ourselves living, that one of the great sins will be this, that people will be ungrateful. And so Paul, time and time again, calls to the church to rediscover gratitude. To not be the thankless child, but to express thanksgiving to God. As our text says, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the reason why God spoke to the Israelites through Moses, why God spoke through, through Paul, through his writings, is because it is possible to be a grateful child. It is possible to be a thankful people. But it requires a choice. In fact, it requires us to choose every day to thank God for His good gifts. And yes, we are living in a day when people are very, very ungrateful. But that does not have to be for us. It is possible to live as Paul calls us to live, giving thanks in everything to the Father through the Son. Well, how do we make that choice? How do we, every day, choose to be grateful? Well, I have been looking at Thanksgiving for 30 years of ministry, and one of the, the best ways that I've found is to talk to myself. Self-talk is not just something that you might find on the psychiatrist's couch. But self-talk really is found throughout the Bible when we are, are called to, to verbalize a truth that God wants us to know, to, to speak out words that change our perspective. And so I've been thinking about, you know, how do we change our perspectives? How can we talk to ourselves in such a way that we are more grateful people? And it's very interesting. I found some of the answers from a very unusual source. I found it from a secular writer. The man's name is a Greg Rochelle. And he's a happiness expert. And he was talking about being happy. And part of being happy, he says, is learning to be grateful. And he offered three statements that I would like to, to adapt for our thinking tonight. Three statements that are in line with God's biblical truth. That if we begin to speak them to ourselves on a regular basis, will change our perspective from ungrateful children to people overflowing with Thanksgiving in all things. So I just want to share three statements with you this evening. They are very, very simple. Doesn't require a theological degree. Doesn't require uh, really anything other than to take them to heart. Simple, yet I believe very, very powerful statements. The first statement is this. I will remember that everything I have is a gift from God. I will remember that everything I have is a gift from God. Everything is a gift from God. And I want to show you a way that you can reflect upon this. So we're going to do a couple of exercises tonight. Don't worry, you don't have to get out of your pew. First thing I want you to do is to take your deepest breath and hold it for as long as you can. Okay? On the count of three. Deepest breath. Hold it for as long as you can. I guarantee I will puff out probably before most of you will. But here we go. One, two, three.
Okay, I'm going to keep on talking. <laughs> now just breathe in and out for a second. Your very breath is a gift from God. But there are people who struggle. Asthma, heart failure, lung damage, you have to take those breaths. They recognize how precious it is to breathe, but we take it for granted until we hold our breath and realize what if I can't take another one? Second exercise, put your hand over your heart. Can you feel your heart beating? Rick Warren says, what is the beating of your heart? He says it's purpose. I think it's life. I used to take the beating of my heart for granted until I was laid out in a hospital bed and the doctor says, you have two very, very plugged arteries. We've got to put in a stent. And then they told me, we've got one that we cannot stent because of its location. I am very, very aware of the beat of my heart. I'm very, very aware when it goes up, when it goes down, when it jumps around. But even that is a gift from God. So if you just begin right there, the air you breathe, the beat of your heart, you understand that everything is a gift from God because everything comes from the gift of life. The ability to work. The ability to, to have and to raise a family. The ability to enjoy all of the blessings of God are dependent upon those two simple things. Breathing in, breathing out. Heartbeat, heartbeat, heartbeat. And at the end of the day, everything else is irrelevant. But everything that we have is a gift from God. We are dependent upon God. There is nothing we ultimately do for ourselves that he does not give us beginning with the beat of our heart and the breath of our lungs. You know, humans like to say, me, 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 look at me, look at me. We start in, you know, the crib, little kids, look at me, look at me, mommy, look at me, daddy. And we go through life that way. That was the problem of the Israelites in the promised land. Look at me, look what I did. Look at me, look what I grew. Look at me, look what I built. In these last days, it continues. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Look what I have done. But Paul says that's not the way. Paul says, I will remember that everything I have is a gift from God. So it's not me, me, me. It's he. He did this. He gave this to me. He supplied me with this. He is the beat of my heart. He is the breath of my lungs. And everything that comes from that comes from him. You sing the song, Count Your Blessings. Do that. You can do that tomorrow. You sit around the table. What are you thankful for? I know families still do that. But start with the breath of your lungs and the beat of your heart. And thank God for everything that flows from that. Remember that everything you have is a gift from God. Statement number two. I will not let what I want rob me of what I have. I will not let what I want rob me of what I have. Fairly soon after I, I got here, preached a series on discontentment. And I said, discontentment really is a national obsession. Because it seems everybody wants more. More of this, more of that, more, more, more. We want bigger this, bigger that. 
We want better this, better that, and we put ourselves into this, this, this treadmill of craziness trying to chase something that always seems to be out of our reach because we never have enough. They asked the billionaire, you know, John Paul Getty, how much is enough? His reply was, just one dollar more. We're discontented. We're focused on what we do not have. We're always trying to keep up with the Joneses. You know, what does the neighbor have that I want? I want that house. I want that car. I want that, you know, place by the river. I want a better harvest. I want a, you know, a better job. And that's what we obsess about. And when you think so much about those things, you miss the blessings that God has already given you. There's a story of a, of a billionaire who is walking alongside uh, the seashore. And he sees a, a man out fishing. Got the hat pulled down over his eyes and he's just got the, the line in the water and he's just sitting there. And the, and the millionaire goes up to him and says, what are you doing? He said, I'm fishing. He says, that's all the ambition you have? And says, why? He says, you know that if you get a second fishing pole, you can get twice the amount of fish. The man says, okay. And maybe you want to get a third fishing pole and, and another fishing pole. Think of all the fish you could catch. And the guy says, okay. And you know, soon you'll start catching more and more fish so you can hire men to help you catch more and more fish. And the man said, well, what do I do with more and more fish? Well, you get a bunch of boats. And if you get a bunch of boats and a bunch of men, you can get more and more fish and you can go on and on and just build a fishing empire. The man lifted up his straw hat, looked at him and said, and then what? And the billionaire said, well, then you can relax and catch fish. But that's the mindset. And we're so worried about what we do not have that we forget those things that, that are there. Paul says, I have learned to be content in all situations. I've learned to be content when I have a lot. I've learned to be content when I have little. Paul says that's the secret of life is contentment. To be thankful for what God does. Most of you, probably at one point, you've either seen it hanging in your parents' or grandparents' home, probably hanging in yours, the picture of the old man praying over that little loaf of bread. And there's a story behind that. That there was this old man that the painter had seen, and he asked him, you know, that seems like so little just a, a loaf of bread. But he said, it's a loaf of bread with God. And that's reason enough to be thankful. Over the years, I've had a lot of contact with people living in different countries and working with orphanages and, 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 and churches that are you know, nothing more than a mud floor and a, a tin roof. Yet when you talk to them, they are so grateful for what they have. They are so excited that God has blessed them, even in these little ways. You know, none of us would want to worship that way. We want padded pews. We want a, a roof that doesn't leak. We want air conditioning in the summer. But they are praising God for the small things. I'm sure they'd like a little more. But they're not going to allow that envy, that jealousy, that desire to overwhelm the thanksgiving for what they have. I will not let what I want rob me of what I already have. It is the simplest gifts that are sometimes the best blessings. 
I will remember that everything I have comes from God. I will not let what I want rob me of what I have. And then the last is this. I will turn my problems into praise. I will turn my problems into praise. And I found this out uh, from all places watching a, uh, a clip of the Glenn Beck show. Glenn Beck is a, uh, is a conservative uh, uh, commentator. He's uh, been in the news of late because uh, one of his charities, one of his uh, uh, foundations that he works with helped rescue uh, Christians from, from Afghanistan. But a few years back on Thanksgiving, he shared his journal, just a page out of his journal that he keeps by his bed. And his understanding, his perspective shows us how we can turn our problems into praise. I need to get close. My eyes aren't that good. He, he wrote, I am grateful for early wake-ups. He said, I have children who jump into bed. Doesn't matter how late I went to sleep, they're up every morning at the crack of dawn and they're jumping on the bed. He says, I can be unhappy about that. He says, or I can thank God that I have children to love. He says, I am grateful for a house to clean because that means I have a safe place to live. He goes, I can thank God for the piles of laundry because that means I have clothes to wear. I can thank God for dishes in the sink because that means I have something to eat. I can thank God for crumbs under the table because that meant that I had a meal with my family. I can, can thank God for the grocery shopping in spite of inflation. Why? because I have money to provide for the family. I can be thankful for toilets to clean, because I've got indoor plumbing. I can be thankful for lots of noise, because that means I have people in my life. I can be thankful for the endless questions about homeworks, because it means my kids probably have brains. And I can be thankful for getting into bed sore and tired, because it means I'm alive. If discontentment is the national obsession, complaining is the national pastime. And I can say that it's true because I moved here from the number one state in the union for the most complaining individuals, the state of New Jersey. People in New Jersey will complain about everything. They'll complain about it being too sunny. They'll complain about the rain. They'll complain about the crowds. They'll complain that there's nobody there. So I've lived for 20-odd years with complaining. And what do you do about it? What does it do? It just makes you mad. And the more you complain, the more you feed off your complaints. And the more you're surrounded by complaining people, guess what? You pick up their bad habits. Not that I ever liked waiting in line or getting caught in traffic, but it got a whole lot worse when I moved to New Jersey. And there are moments when you'd sit in the car and you'd curse the guy ahead of you who was cursing the guy ahead of him and so on and so on and so on that I remember sitting there saying, this is kind of stupid. And I thought about Glenn Beck and I thought about what the Bible says about learning contentment. And you stop and you realize... You know, what does complaining get you? But time and time again, you see people in the Bible turning their problems into praise. Who see the, 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 the silver lining in their troubles. And you know people like that. They're great people to be around because they can look at a problem and immediately turn it into a praise. Just like Beck did. You know, we complain about the noise and the, and the chaos and the confusion of a home full of, of children. But you know what? It means God has given us happy, healthy kids who run around and do what kids do. You know, we may complain about having to get up early in the morning, 
having to go and put in the time at work. But you know, labor is a gift from God. And it puts food on the table. Rain or shine. All of those things are part of God's plan, part of God's purpose. And too often we, we jump to why that's wrong. Why, God, are you doing this to me? But if you dwell on your problems, all you're going to do is increase your grief. And the more you complain, the more you complain, the more you complain. And so I think Beck's idea is a great idea. List those complaints and see how you can turn them into prayer. Look at those things that you think are stumbling blocks and realize that God is using them to prepare you for what lies ahead. We're ungrateful. Even the best of us has these moments when we say, you know, Lord, I don't have enough. Lord, this isn't right. Lord, you've taken something from me that I didn't feel I deserve to lose. I work and I work, yet... It never seems to change. But remember that the breath that you have and the, the beat of your heart, that's a gift from God from which all blessings flow. That if you're only focused on what you don't have, you're going to miss right the things that are in front of you. And if you turn your problems into praise, you're going to realize that you have more than 10,000 reasons to sing to the Father. You have a choice every day. Every day you have a choice. Am I going to, to complain? Am I going to grumble? Am I going to look at what I do not have? Am I going to be unhappy? I can choose that, and sadly many do. Or are you going to choose joy? Are you going to choose contentment? Are you going to choose the simple pleasures and thank God for them? Every morning when you rise, you can choose to be a thankless child or part of a grateful people. You get to choose each day. Choose the psalmist who says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. Let's pray. Father, we thank You today. We thank you for the breath of our lungs, the beat of our heart, for every good and perfect gift that comes from above. May we remember that everything comes from you and we are dependent upon you for all things. Father, don't let what we want rob us of what you have already given us. Let us look around and, and count our blessings. And when we are tempted to complain, May we turn those problems into praise. May we see that there is a plan, there is a purpose that in everything we can give you thanks. Father, make us a grateful people, not only on Thanksgiving Day, but every day, days without end. Amen. Come, ye thankful people, come. Let's respond to God's word tonight.
The offering we now receive will be for the Douglas County Food Pantry. Let us pray. Father, we have sung of your blessings. We have reflected upon the good things that you have given us. Yet, Father, we look around and we know that there are others who appear not to have enjoyed that same blessing. And that is what you have called us to do tonight. To be your instrument of grace. To be those givers that allow others to be grateful to you. Father, we give because you have given to us for the blessing of those who do not have and to your praise, honor, and glory. We give these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
Thank you.